Hi everyone, so I'm Sarah Davido. I'm part of the Western Mass uh, Recovery Learning Community. Thank you to everyone for pulling this together and especially to Tina Minkowitz for having me here. And I'm just gonna trust that my slides are going to appear up there sometimes. <laughs> there we go, okay. So I guess to start, I just, I wanna share a little bit of something different, a little bit about what happened to me. And the piece I'm gonna share starts in 2010. In 2010, I had two miscarriages. And that was a very, very traumatic experience for me. And then in 2011, I was pregnant again. And I wasn't doing so well with that. I was really, really freaked out quickly about what was gonna happen. Was this going to be okay? And I had some really interesting interactions with doctors through that. In part of that experience, I was calling them up. I was saying, you have to do an ultrasound. You have to tell me that the baby's still there. I, you know, granted, I was a little you know, out of balance and I just wanted them to show me that the baby was still there. They kicked me out of the practice. Okay, so the second doctor didn't kick me out, but thought perhaps I should be taking psychiatric drugs while I was pregnant because of how I was reacting to that experience. And I thought, okay, I just have to get through this. If I can get through this pregnancy, everything will be okay. And then in October 11th, 2011, my daughter was born and everything was not okay. I started having visions that were telling me that I needed to hurt my baby. Those visions were pretty specific, especially when I was in a, one of my workplaces on the third floor. It, they wanted me to drop my baby over the railing, uh, which was down all the way down three floors. And I didn't tell anyone. And one of the reasons I didn't tell anyone is I've been in the system before. I've reached out for help before, and what that had resulted in was force. Forced psychiatric hospitalization, drugs, etc. And so what I had learned from that experience was do not tell. And even more was at stake at this point. What was gonna happen if I told people that I was having visions of hurting my child? Would I still get to have my child? So I would just hold her a little bit tighter when those visions would come and I would just hope that it was gonna stop. I would hope that I was gonna get through it. And at some point, I found myself in a hearing voices group. And I'm not a big group person. You won't find me in a lot of groups, but here I was. And it was the first time that I had an opportunity to just think about, why is this happening? What does this mean? And it came to me pretty quickly. I actually didn't talk about it out loud. I was listening to other people try and make sense of their own voices and visions and other unusual experiences, but it came to me. What was happening was that I was blaming my body for killing those other two babies. And when I was on the third floor of that workplace, that was actually the place, the very place, that I felt that first miscarriage start to happen. And that was the connection for me. And once I made that connection, it started to shift for me. And so I guess what I want to talk to you about are the options the alternatives, because I will tell you right now that the things that I experienced in the system ended up not being all that different, different than the verbal abuse, the emotional abuse, the sexual abuse, the rape that I experienced from people who were trying to hurt me. And frankly, sometimes both the people who were doing those explicit things of abuse and the people in the system who diagnosed me told me that there's something wrong with my brain, forced me. They all told me you know, that they cared about me. Particularly the people in the system told me that they were trying to help. And all of it hurt, and there are different options. And just in those moments of having those different options, learning that I could look at my experience in some different sort of way, something very important changed for me. I think with the Hearing Voices Network, that is something that developed in Europe in over 30 countries at this point, and I don't have time to tell you what it's all about, but the truth is that a lot of it's pretty simple. A lot of it is pretty simple. It is about giving that space to make different meaning. It is about understanding that the problem isn't maybe the hearing voices, isn't maybe the visions, isn't maybe those experiences, but how people are supported to move through them and make meaning of them. And understanding that there are many paths that, frankly, the systems in many countries just don't tell you about. And maybe even more important, 
is that there's no assumption of illness. There's no person telling me that while I'm pregnant, I should take psychiatric drugs, that that's the problem. That, you know, forget the trauma of having those miscarriages. Forget why you're having those experiences. Just let's, let's fix it. There's nobody doing that in this Hearing Voices Network. And very important, the goal is not to get rid of those experiences. So what if we can switch the way that we think about these things to the idea that when those visions come, it's a sign, it's telling me something, it's telling me that I'm really stressed out and I'm blaming myself for something. What if we could teach each other to read those signs and trying, instead of trying to crush them out? And there's no assumption that those experiences have to be bad. They can have meaning. Those signs can actually be helpful. They can tell us we need to pause and we need to think and we need to reevaluate what's going on for us. And as I'm sure many of you have heard, those experiences don't have to be scary. Even the things that, you know, that, those visions were very scary to me. They stopped being scary to me after a while. And honestly, if you talk to people who hear voices and have visions, lots of them are just, they were never scary. They're the people, the voices, the existences around us that keep us company, that remind people of things they forgot. I got to spend a lot of time with Jackie Dillon, who's in England, a big part of the Hearing Voices movement just in this past week, and she's always telling me, oh, what you just said, yeah, my voices were reminding me to think about that, or I'm alone in my hotel room, voices are keeping me company. There's so many different ways that we can think about these things if we step out of what we have been told. So 99 groups and counting, in the United States. I'm actually traveling to Maryland this Sunday to go offer another Hearing Voices training. These are not rocket science sorts of things, but they are very different than what we are being told in the media and in the system. This is my daughter. She's fine. She's five and a half now. The half is very important to her. She's very <laughs> mad when I don't mention it. We were at Build a Bear a couple of weeks ago. That's what this is from. <laughs> so I just want to talk to you about alternatives to suicide briefly. It's similar to hearing voices. It actually is something that the Western Massachusetts Recovery Learning Community developed, and it's, it's similar. And actually, while I was driving here last night, I stopped in Connecticut at an event uh, to talk about suicide that was led by a psychiatrist. And as a side note, my great accomplishment in that event is hearing someone else tell me that I've, I've been emailing back and forth with a psychiatrist, sort of arguing with the psychiatrist and someone else told me he's been talking about me. So I figure I'm doing my work <laughs> if I'm getting into his conversation. So, but one of the things that he said is 90% of people who consider attempt complete suicide have quote unquote mental illness. But here's the problem with that. When I went to a psychologist and talked about self-injury and suicide, that is what got me diagnosed. So how does that work? I am quote unquote mentally ill because I am suicidal, but I'm suicidal because I'm mentally ill, it becomes meaningless. So there has to be more. And actually, I know this is hard to read, it's in one of my Mad in America blogs if you want to track me down that way, but there's so many things that people mean when they say, I am suicidal or I'm thinking about killing myself. So many things, sometimes it just means there's a part of my life that is unbearable. You know, sometimes it means the system has trained me, that's what I need to say. There's so many things. And then if it's actually that I want to die, there's so many reasons. And it's not generally a psychiatric diagnosis, this thing that someone else has put on us. So we need to think beyond that. And this idea of suicide prevention, so the crux of alternatives to suicide is that it's not suicide prevention. Very similar to hearing voices, it's about giving people space to make meaning. And why do I say it's not suicide prevention? I say it's not suicide prevention because in suicide prevention, we are told we are responsible for someone. We are told we are responsible for making you stop, making you not take action. In alternatives to suicide, we talk about being responsible to each other, to each other to be present, to each other to explore, be curious, and create community and connections. And instead of just forcing someone to be alive when they don't want to be, it's about creating space where maybe they want to be in this world with each other. So I wish I had more time to tell you what all these things actually look like. But the truth is, they look like being human with one another. And our society, our systems have kind of trained that out of us. And force, the force that is driven by that sense of control and that sense of needing to stop each other, that force is not an option. 
You know, sometimes we hear people talk about like, well, force is the last resort. Force is one of many options. Force is not an option, it's a lack of options. It is what the system does with people when they don't know what else to do, so they're just gonna put you on pause. They're gonna drug you up, they're gonna lock you up, they're gonna put you away until maybe someday they can figure out, and they don't really consider the harm. That psychiatrist, I asked him, he was talking about 13 Reasons Why, probably some of you have heard about that show, right? Big, big deal show. And he was so concerned with whether or not 13 Reasons Why is harming people and causing more suicide attempts. And I raised my hand, and he recognized me right away from my emails when I raised my hand and started talking. And I asked him why we're spending so much time thinking about that and not thinking about the fact that research is now showing that the treatment, the hospitalization, is leading to over 100 times increased risk of suicide. Why aren't we talking about that? Why aren't we talking about the fact that the treatment, especially forced treatment, has shown no <coughs> improvement of outcomes? If we want to compare it to the medical world, most medical treatments have shown improvement. This is the only area that has shown no improvement. So we need to be thinking about that, and we need to understand that the key here is unlearning. So Henry David Thoreau said, when any real progress is made, we unlearn and learn anew before we thought we knew, uh, what we thought we knew before. And if you don't want to hear from that particular American figure, I have a boiled down statement from uh, Yoda. <laughs> You must unlearn what you have learned. <laughs> we need to do that together. Thank you. Good job. <laughs>